Seventy percent of Christian men, uh, one survey says, struggle with issues of pornography. The two typical situations are issues of either abuse or neglect uh, to set someone up for sexual addiction. Did you act out this week? Yes, I did. Well, try to do better next time. See you next week. <laughs> if that's what accountability groups are for you, you're doing it wrong. If I say, no, my sin is so great, the blood of the Son of God can't cover that. I'm saying there is a power in the universe greater than God, and that power is my sin. That's ridiculous. It only takes one drop of Jesus' blood to redeem the world. Welcome to Pure Passion. My name is Jonathan Darty. On today's program, we're going to look at a problem that statistics indicate plagues over half of the male population, both inside and outside the church. We're talking about what therapists call sex addiction and what the Bible calls bondage to sexual immorality. This would include a bondage to pornography, adultery, compulsive masturbation, promiscuity, and other more exotic forms of compulsive sexual behavior. Our guest is Russell Willingham, himself a former sex addict and author of the book, Breaking Free. Russell was a guest on this program several years ago, and along with the ministry that he founded, New Creation Ministries of Fresno, California, is the winner of the 2011 Pure Passion Award, which is given each year to a ministry and its leader who exemplify passionate, risk-taking obedience to the Great Commission, particularly in the area of God's pursuit of sexually bound and broken people. So if this is an area of temptation in your life or the life of a loved one, I think you're going to benefit greatly from what Russell has to say. Uh, many people assume that sexual addiction is just an issue of sexual sin or uh, a lack of self-control. And certainly it is sin. Certainly there are issues of control. Uh, but true sexual addiction is also uh, a problem of intimacy. It's a problem of identity. It's a problem of uh, even arrested development, if I can use that phrase. Uh, the men and women that I've worked with over the years are basically men and women who uh, have experienced trauma in the formative years of life, uh, are looking for some very real nurturing and uh, attachment that they may have missed out on in the first uh, 10, 15 years of life. And as adults, many times, this is one of the ways they're trying to seek that and find that. Uh, it's a misguided attempt, obviously, uh, an ineffective attempt, but it's their way of trying to find touch and connection, and uh, it's subconscious. They don't even realize. Scripture addresses this in uh, Proverbs 27 when it says, to the full, even honey is loathsome, but to the hungry, even that which is bitter tastes sweet. So that's talking about when someone is hungry, when they're starving, even emotionally, they'll, 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 imbibe in anything. They'll, they'll take anything in to try to, to try to quench that thirst, to feed that hunger. And this is a great example of that. And so the sexual addict is, is using sex or pornography or affairs uh, or even their own fantasy life to, to try to meet a need for connection and attachment and love. And th those core needs are absolutely legitimate God-given needs. But the way the sexual addict goes about it, of course, is, is illegitimate. It's sinful, it's destructive. And many Christians struggle with it, unfortunately. In fact, it's kind of the secret addiction within the church. Uh, anywhere from, oh, 70% uh, of Christian men, uh, one survey says, struggle with issues of pornography. And that may be a conservative estimate. So this is a huge problem with Christians, with Christian men, more and more Christian women are struggling as well. And uh, it wreaks havoc on obviously families, relationships, uh, and where people are at in their relationship with God. The two typical situations are issues of either abuse or neglect uh, to set someone up for sexual addiction. Uh, abuse, obviously, physical, sexual, uh, psychological abuse, spiritual abuse. Those are things that have been done to a child that should have never been done. Uh, obviously, 
when a, when a child experiences things like that, it sends a message to the child that the child is uh, not loved, is worthless, uh, deserves to be mistreated. That really begins to, to set up this feeling of, of self-hate, self-loathing in a child's heart. And so the child then uh, looks for any way they can to alleviate that pain. But neglect can be just as powerful, uh, neglect and or abandonment. And the thing about neglect and abandonment is it's harder to spot. And people that I've worked with over the years who've experienced that often don't know that that is in their background because abuse is something that has occurred that shouldn't have occurred. Neglect and abandonment is something that didn't happen that should have. So uh, many times I've, I've talked with people like that. I said, well, my family was great. You know, my parents stayed together or we were, you know, a nuclear family. But I will ask them, well, how did your parents nurture you? Well, you know, my, my dad worked every day and we, he put a roof over our head or he went to my baseball games, but how did your father or how did your mother touch your spirit? Well, I don't know. They said they loved me and patted me on the head. That's not nurture. Nurture is far more profound than that. And, and sometimes parents are caught up in their own workaholism or their own addictions, or you know, the mother is busy in the kitchen all day long, the father is busy in the TV room, and that amounts to abandonment, that amounts to emotional neglect. And so that sets up what we talked about from Psalm 27, seven, where that starving soul is looking for something. And many times that creates the, the, uh, the conditions for somebody to, to, to try to find something to fill that hole. And sex addiction uh, often is the thing they turn to. I think the affirmation piece is huge, whether that creates someone who's vulnerable to sexual abuse or whether it causes someone who just has this hungry soul. And uh, my first book on sex addiction called Breaking Free, I wanted to call it Lonely to the Core. Uh, the publisher changed the name because that's not a very encouraging, uplifting title. But it, it sure explains the inner world of the sexual addict. It's lonely. The person may be married, have kids, be successful in their job or their ministry or their church. But deep inside, the loneliness is pathological. They feel it at a core existential level. Now, this is really the human condition, but, but it's, it's acute for the person who is sexually or relationally broken. They ache, and there are spiritual and psychological uh, and emotional reasons for this. But yeah, the lack of affirmation is huge. And so also the healing for the sexual addict has to involve huge doses of affirmation from the Lord and from other members of the body of Christ. Faith, in my view, is another way of even saying obedience. If I exercise faith, I'm trusting that what God said is true and I'm acting accordingly. So, for instance, if, if Jesus says that I'm beloved, that he loved me so much that he left his throne in heaven and came here to redeem me, that I have that kind of value to him, then faith means I believe him, not the hateful, inner voices, not the, not the instinct that goes down to the bone inside of me that says, I'm not worth anything. Faith is me saying, Lord, I believe you, not myself, not, my, not the inner voices, I believe you. And in fact, that's repentance. I repent, Lord, of seeing myself as a disgusting, loathsome creature. Please forgive me for saying those things over my heart again today. You say that I'm redeemed, that I'm a child, of yours, that I'm worthwhile, that I'm inestimably loved. How dare I say anything in contradiction to you, God of the universe? That's what repentance looks like. And that's what faith looks like. That's how I act. And I might have to do that several times an hour. So that's where faith and repentance and, and demolishing strongholds and taking everything captive, that's where they all converge in one instant. So many of us do struggle with the, this feeling of, my sin is so heinous that God can't forgive me. We hear about the blood of Christ. We hear about the cross, the forgiveness of God. We say, absolutely, Jesus came to die for sinners, to forgive sinners. Everyone except me. I alone am unique among sinners. My sin 
is exceptional. Number one, that's actually a, a reverse type of pride and narcissism. Uh, and we don't have time to go into that. But again, we're believing our own hearts over God. And I've struggled with that as a recovering sexual addict, as someone who's been involved in sexual sin, uh, things that have caused me great grief, uh, especially in my youth. I've, I've, I've carried the load of that and I had to look to the Word of God. How do you combat that? Well, you don't combat it by waiting until you feel better about your sin, because you'll never feel good about your sin. We have to take God at His Word. Just a very simple verse that, that I, have, I have clung to many, many times over the years is from Colossians chapter 2, and it's verse 13. It says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. I have that word all circled in my Bible. That is an all-inclusive word. So if I was involved in bestiality, if I molested a child, if I did some unspeakable crime, if I killed someone, that comes under the heading of all. If I say, no, my sin is so great, the blood of the Son of God can't cover that. I'm saying there is a power in the universe greater than God, and that power is my sin. That's ridiculous. It only takes one drop of Jesus' blood to redeem the world. So again, in our pride and sinfulness, we elevate ourselves, we elevate our own thoughts of ourselves, we even elevate our sin above God. And we've got to repent of that. We've got to repent of it on a daily basis. Jesus died for all sin, no matter what it is. Now, it's hard for us to grasp that emotionally, but again, we can't go off of emotion. We have to live by faith, not by feeling, especially in this regard. And that's the secret that saints throughout history have relied on. And again, we, we think of saints, we think of some of the great saints, we think, well, they didn't have any real sin. Well, you should read some of their stories. Read about Augustine and some of the things he was involved in and, and others who, uh, like John Newton, before he wrote Amazing Grace and uh, was involved in the slave trade and went down below deck and helped himself to some of the African slave girls. That's left out of some of the autobiographies because obviously it was a bit racy. But these are real men who were involved in real sin and experienced real grace. Jesus Christ, like Paul says, came into the world to save sinners. And we need to accept that and keep fighting to hold on to that for ourselves because it's the truth. Our hearts will scream against it and rebel against it. But if I have to choose between what God says or what my heart says, I've got to continue to go with God. And I might have to do it several times an hour. I really think the, the scripture in 2 Corinthians uh, 10 about taking every thought captive is really a parallel verse to Romans 12, where it says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I think those are parallel verses that are saying the same thing with different words. What Paul is telling us there is that transformation happens when we change our beliefs. Uh, and until we change our beliefs, we don't change. We can change our behaviors. We can go to church twice as often as we were before. Uh, but unless our worldview changes, unless our core belief changes, uh, we don't change. We don't experience transformation. And taking thoughts captive basically means that we, we begin to really think through the, the daily... Uh, chatter that goes through our mind, and we stop and say, now is that truth or is that falsehood? Where did I learn this, this self-talk that, that I'm listening to? Is, is that authoritative? Who taught me that? Is that credible? Uh, is that what God says about me, or is that what I say about me, or is that what my family taught me, or my culture? Is that shame? Is that self-hate? Could that be the devil? Most of us don't stop and think through we're very lazy in that regard. And so we just continue to get beat up by the negative self-talk that goes on in our minds. And Paul's saying, you can't do that. You can't afford to do that. One philosopher said that the uh, unexamined life isn't worth living. And he's actually thinking biblically when he says that, because we've got to stop and experience change at the interior level, what psychologists call the intrapsychic level, where we really examine 
our core beliefs. And according to Scripture, though on the one hand we are deeply sinful and flawed and dark, in fact, it's scarier than most of us are willing to find out. Most of us are too afraid to know the truth about how deep that goes. But on the flip side, we are also deeply, unbelievably loved and valuable. And those two truths, if we can take them uh, together, are absolutely life-changing. The, the, the knowledge of our sinfulness keeps us, or it can keep us from pride and arrogance and from thinking we have everything we need in ourselves. But the knowledge of our belovedness will protect us from self-hate and from d despair and from this feeling of smallness. If we know we really are the apple of God's eye, but again, that's where the self-talk really destroys us because we listen to the voice that says, you're a nobody unless you, you know, earn a lot of money and drive a Lexus and have a, a gorgeous wife or you, you're nobody, you're nothing. And that's that negative self-talk that Paul says, you've got to take that captive. You've got to demolish that stronghold. But again, we are so accustomed to li listening to that negative voice. We have to listen to the voice of Christ. And Jesus never, ever, ever says things like that to us. But we're not accustomed to listening to his voice. We're accustomed to listening to the voice of self-hate and shame. The scripture is very clear that God absolutely gives the born-again man or woman power. The born-again man or woman has power. In fact, Peter likes to say that we already have everything we need for life and godliness. If, if you have been born again, then you have within you all of the resources of heaven right now, today, at this moment. But the problem is when we, when we say power, most of us, we think feelings. We think, we hear power, but what we think is something euphoric, overwhelming, uh, uh, mood altering. So if it's powerful, it's got to transport me. But when the Bible talks about power, it's not necessarily talking about like a drug experience. So I may have all kinds of power inside of me and not feel anything. It doesn't mean I don't have power. I've got the, the very God of the universe who spoke and all of creation began to dance in obedience to his word. That God lives inside of me right now. As I speak, I don't have a particular sense of power, but I have the living God inside of me. Now, if I wait to feel something before I try to act on that, uh, I'm gonna go grow cobwebs under my arms, but I can't do that. Faith enables me to say, I'm not going to wait till I feel something. Christ is a person, not a feeling. But so many of us Christians were so bound up in, well, I need to feel something. Power is not about feeling. Power is a reality. The question is, uh, how does a sexually broken person or a sexually addicted person begin to move toward being relational. Uh, in one sense, that's the hardest thing in the world to do. Because if I'm a sexual addict, for instance, I'm used to living in my own little world, living in my own head, living in isolation. And how am I going to change that? This is where accountability groups, support groups are absolutely key. Uh, in our own ministry, we push this hard, not because it's a recovery idea or they did it in AA or it's a new fad, but because number one, it's biblical, and number two, there is no healing without it. James 5.16 says, confess your sins to each other, pray for each other that you might be healed. Uh, not only is there power in, in that confession and in that prayer, but there's power in the relational dynamic present in that setting which shouldn't surprise us based on everything that I've just said. The group is where many of us begin to learn for the first time in our lives often how to start doing this. And in the group, hopefully it's not just a reporting time. Well, did you act out this week? Yes, I did. Well, try to do better next time. See you next week. <laughs> if that's what accountability groups are for you, you're doing it wrong. Accountability groups should begin to form into real opportunities to relate, to risk, to fall in love with the other people in that group. That's what it's really about. 
Getting sexually sober is, is key, but that's not really the end goal here. The goal for the sexual addict, for any Christian, is to become relational. That's what we lost in the Garden of Eden, is our ability to be relational. When God said, when you eat from this fruit, you're going to die. Well, Adam and Eve ate from the fruit. They didn't expire. They didn't drop dead. They didn't fall horizontal to the ground. They still stood up, but something died all right. And it was their ability to feel comfortable with God in their own heart and with each other. It was extinguished on the spot, and we've never recovered. Their ability to be relational was destroyed. And in Christ, we get that back. But even as spirit-filled Christians, we have to learn how to grow back into a relational way of living and engaging each other. And that's done over time through great difficulty for most of us. So for the sexual struggler, regardless of whether it's gay, straight, bi, you name it, a febophile, pedophile, whatever, our own unique attractions or brokenness might be, the answer is the same. We have to learn how to become healthily relational. And in a group, we start to do that. And hopefully we start to develop maybe two or three close relationships. Uh, if you're a man with other brothers, if you're a woman with other sisters, and we start to take those risks we were talking about. We have some courage. We talk honestly. We don't just share about our struggles, but we share about uh, what we're feeling right now, what I might be feeling with you in this moment. I might be in a group and I might say, you know, I feel intimidated when I hear you talk because you seem so much smarter than me. And you can say, well, oh, please don't. I, I, feel, I feel so small myself most of the time. And me hearing you say that puts my heart at ease. What's happening? We're taking risks. We're being honest. Uh, we're learning things about ourselves. Uh, all kinds of powerful healing things are taking place. This is the way the church is supposed to function every day. Unfortunately, it doesn't, and sometimes only in a recovery group can it happen. But even some recovery groups don't do this. So how does a sexually broken person learn to be relational? I think it can start in recovery groups. Again, but if that group is just exclusively focused around the 12 steps, or the 10 steps, or the three steps, or, or a Bible study, that it may not be relational. And so we have to be careful. We want to focus on truth, but again, if that truth isn't lived out in a relational context, that truth will fall flat on its face. And again, we don't have time to go into how all of that works, but Jesus does say you can search Scripture, know Scripture, dissect it, and still not be relational. So we have to be relational. If Scripture doesn't lead us to being relational, we're reading it wrong. <laughs> we're not doing it right. The Pharisees were biblical experts. They were not relational. And many Christians are really sharp, biblically, theologically. I have known a lot of Christians who have a lot of recovery knowledge, very savvy, but they're not relational. And if you are not relational, you're missing the whole point of everything. And the Spirit can teach you how to be relational. If I can learn, anybody can learn. I come from a background of abuse and neglect and lifelong depression and despair and isolation and thinking that I was the Lone Ranger. And Jesus Christ has been healing me out of that since I was a little boy. I live to be relational now with Him, with my wife, with close friends that I meet with on a regular basis. I can be honest with myself about the sin, the pride, the arrogance, the selfishness I see in my heart, and yet not hate myself or condemn myself because I'm extravagantly and lavishly loved by my God. And that's changed everything for me. And I didn't come to that knowledge overnight or by memorizing some Bible list. It happened through engagement with God. You know, it's scary to share your true self with God and with others, especially if you envision God as an angry judge in heaven who has nothing but disgust for you. But did you know that that image of God is a lie? In reality, God the Father loves you deeply. He may not approve of some of the things you do, but He loves you, the person, nevertheless. And He wants to forgive you, cleanse you, and empower you to walk with His Son, Jesus. He also wants to bring people into your life who can serve as His agents of unconditional love, people that you can feel safe to share your true heart with. He wants to bring people into your life who can hear the worst about you and love you anyway. Why not begin that journey today? 
Start by initiating or renewing a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ, who the Bible says is the only way to the Father. Then listen for His voice and, and be led by His Spirit to those who can be His hands and feet in your life. And healing will come. Freedom will come through these bonds of love. And come back and see us next week here on Pure Passion. Till I'm living for you, a disciple of truth.